make them tell I'm ready. I'll take everybody. You, 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 and you. I'm ready for everybody. I want to cast light onto the shadows of a once glistening career and uncover the real truth behind one of pop culture's biggest heroes. Weighing 320 pounds, ladies and gentlemen, Hulk Hogan. The international superstar born Terry Bollea was recently seen by millions in a different light. Okay, maniacs, here we go. We were not the most liked guys in the dressing room. We had a, a ton of heat with everybody. In a very short amount of time, and financially, I was devastated. I've had a rough couple of years. I've had two really crazy years. The WWE broke ties with you. Did yes. you expect that was going to happen? No, I didn't. There are no two ways about it, no real room for debate. Hulk Hogan is one of the most culturally significant pro wrestlers to have ever laced up his boots. And beyond that, is one of the most recognisable faces of the 20th century in the United States. Leading the charge as the face of the WWF as Hulkamania ran wild and brought in an exciting new combination of pro wrestling athleticism and Hollywood celebrity. Hulk Hogan adorned in his classic yellow and red attire became a household name throughout his prestigious, award-studded career. He made the transition from the wrestling ring to the silver screen and maintained a presence as a notable public figure for over four decades. Beloved by millions around the globe for his heroic antics and succession of high-caliber victories throughout the 80s and 90s, Hulk Hogan, even today, remains one of the all-time most popular performers in pro wrestling history, and with a wrestling career which saw him selling out arenas around America and selling truckloads of merchandise, as well as signing numerous endorsement and advertising contracts, it's safe to say that Terry Bollea, the man behind the legend, has reaped the rewards of his success. But in the modern day, as stories continue to surface online via social media and through tell-all autobiographies, the shine that once surrounded this immortal figure has begun to wear off. The never give up attitude and good guy shell has begun to crack under the weight of insurmountable evidence, which will be the topic of this video. I want to take a serious look into the history of the Hulk, how he became the immortal one and claim such prominence as Hulkamania became mainstream. With such a storied, eventful and somewhat distant past, it can be hard to really wrap your head around the ways in which things played out and just how often Hulk came out on top. I want to give credit to a man who worked incredibly hard to achieve his unprecedented success and show his climb from small town boy to king of the mountain, and how, over the last decade or so, a twisted web of lies and manipulation have been uncovered and have brought the king falling from his throne. Born on August the 11th, 1953, in Augusta, Georgia, Terry Jean Belair, better known by his in-ring persona of Hulk Hogan, is one of the most recognised wrestling stars worldwide, questionably the most popular wrestler of the 1980s. Shortly after being born, Belair's family would move to Port Tampa in Florida, where he would spend his formative years. As he grew up, he began to excel at baseball and even drew scouts from the Cincinnati Reds and New York Yankees. His career in baseball was short-lived, however, after Belea suffered an injury which meant he was unable to continue playing. Around the age of 16, Terry Belea began to regularly attend wrestling events at the Tampa Sportatorium, as his passion for pro wrestling grew into something more than just a passing phase. Belea has gone on to say that around this time, the first wrestler to really grab his attention and inspire him was Dusty Rhodes during his time at high school. Belea's other main passion was music. He spent many of his teen years performing with a bass guitar for several different bands in the local area, even dropping out of university in South Florida to focus on his musical career. 
Always the Showman, by 1976, Belaya had formed a band with two other amateur musicians, which would turn out to be unexpectedly popular in the local area. Known as Ruckus, the band toured around bars and clubs in the Tampa Bay area. Belaya's practice with the electric guitar and bass were beginning to pay off, and he explained in an interview that this was the first time that he began to feel really confident on stage. Bitten by something of a performer's bug, Belaya decided that in order to stand out and to further improve his on-stage presence, he would begin to fill out his already tall frame, starting to lift weights around the Tampa Bay area in Florida at a notorious pro wrestling hub, Hector's Gym. And thus, at the time as Belaya's ruckus band began to really hit their stride and get repeat bookings at some of Tampa's largest bars and clubs, they performed at a show which was attended by legendary wrestlers and backstage producers, Jack and Jerry Briscoe. The pair, who were always scouting for the newest potential signing, were taken aback by Belaya's size and asked him to give pro wrestling a try. I'm just a stark raving maniac whenever you see me. When Belaya hesitantly agreed, he was sent to train under well-respected wrestling trainer Hiro Matsuda, a man whose job it was then to train the new recruits for championship wrestling from Florida, the promotion in which Terry Belaya would make his very first in-ring appearance. This is where we see the first friction of Belaya's wrestling career occur. As his ability to perform in the ring grew, so did the beginning of what is now a notoriously large ego. Before even stepping into the ring, Belaya's career with CWF was almost over when the then owner of the company and his son refused to allow Belaya his first match on the grounds of some undisclosed dispute between Belaya and Mike Graham, one of the head bookers for CWF and son of head of the company, Eddie Graham. However, Belaya's decision to take pro wrestling more seriously and disband his musical work with Ruckus showed to Eddie and Mike Graham his dedication to the industry. Although this dispute was apparently small enough to be overcome with an adult conversation and some well-meant apologies, since then we've seen this ego and friction of Belaya become one of the core components of his entire story. As Terry Belaya worked in the gym, One day, he was approached once again by Jack Briscoe, who handed him his first ever pair of pro wrestling boots and disclosed the date and time of Belaya's very first match. On August 10th, 1977, Terry Belaya fought against Brian Blair in a match-up in Fort Myers, Florida, and as the bell rang and the match was observed by just a small handful of passionate fans, many of whom didn't know the first thing about Terry Belair or the fact that they had just witnessed the very first match of a career which would become so legendary. Soon after this time, Belair had his face hidden from the crowd so as to allow him more time in the ring in front of a crowd without the risk of memorable amateur mistakes ruining his reputation with the locals. Under the persona of the Super Destroyer, a character which has to date been played by a disputed amount of men, but whom was first created by Don Jardine. Belaya's version of the Super Destroyer saw him dressed in black and red with a black lucha mask covered in stars. After a year's worth of training, Belaya began to concede that Hiro Matsuda was overbearing and starting to hold him back. Belaya believed he would see faster improvement from his training and moved on from CWF at this time. Although approached by several wrestling promoters, Belaya decided to take some time away from the business and assess what he wanted from his future. Now he had tasted a small amount of stardom, he knew he was hooked. However, has since expressed his uncertainty with the financial viability of becoming a pro wrestler at the time. During Belaya's time away, he became the manager of a private club in Florida where he worked for and formed a close friendship with his boss Whitey Bridges. The pair started a gym called Olympic Gym and brought in Ed Leslie to help them run the operation. As Ed Leslie and Terry Belaya spent most of their spare time working out in the gym, both men achieved huge physiques and began to formulate a plan to re-enter the pro wrestling world, this time as a hulking tag team. As at the time, Ed Leslie had no in-ring training, 
Belair promised that if the two men were to travel together, that he would pass on his wrestling knowledge to Leslie, free of charge. The two men began to request a place on the roster of the Alabama territories, away from their original home turf in Florida, and asked if superstar Billy Graham could help them out. Which, as he saw the clear potential of Leslie and Belair as a pairing, agreed to do. Belair and Leslie were quickly offered a job by the owner of the Alabama Territory, Louis Tillett. Known by their in-ring name of the Boulder Brothers, Belair as Terry Boulder and Ed Leslie as Ed Boulder. The two began to work matches for Tillett and were paid $175 each per week. Jerry Jarrett, then promoter for Continental Wrestling Association, booked the Boulder Brothers on his show, where he was seemingly so impressed that after their match, Jarrett offered the men an enormous pay rise of $800 per week each, if they came and joined his promotion full-time, an offer which was as quickly made by Jarrett as it was swiftly accepted by Belair and Leslie, who immediately left the employ of Louis Tillett to travel down with Jarrett to Memphis. Throughout the end of 1979, Belair transitioned away from being a part of a tag team and fought in the ring for Georgia Championship Wrestling under the name of Sterling Golden. Under this moniker, Belair won several squash matches but never began to build up any form of momentum from the crowds who, aside from a few women who can be heard showering Sterling with wolf whistles and screams, gave Belair a lukewarm reception. When Terry Belair appeared on a local Memphis chat show, he was interviewed alongside Hollywood actor and famed bodybuilder Lou Ferrigno, a man whose most notable role saw him playing the muscle-clad Incredible Hulk on a much-beloved television show. At this time, Belair was truly starting to come into his prime as regards to his physical shape. He was tall, shredded and handsome, with striking blue eyes and pumped up confidence which could see him fill any room with his presence. Next to the Belair, Lou Ferrigno, who was otherwise known for his stature, looked small, leading to a comment from the presenter who discussed the idea that Belair was indeed the true Hulk. Terry the Hulk Boulder was born and thus begins the road to Hulkamania. From this point, Hogan frequently referred to his fans as Hulkamaniacs in his interviews and introduced his three demandments, training, saying his prayers and eating his vitamins. Hogan's ring gear developed a characteristic yellow and red colour scheme. His ring entrances involved him ritualistically ripping his shirt off of his body, flexing and listening for audience cheers in an exaggerated manner. The majority of Hogan's matches during this time involved him wrestling against opponents who had been booked as unstoppable monsters, using a format which became near routine. Hogan would deliver steady offence but eventually lose momentum, seemingly nearing defeat. After being hit with his opponent's finishing move, he would then experience a sudden second wind, fighting back while feeding off the energy of the audience, becoming impervious to attack, a process now known as hulking up. His signature manoeuvres pointing at the opponent, which would later be accompanied by a loud you from the audience. Shaking his finger to scold them, three punches, an Irish whip, the big boot and the running leg drop would all ensure him a victory. On the leg drop, Hogan said, when I dropped the leg and nobody kicked out, it meant something. In the arenas nowadays, in professional wrestling, if someone used a leg drop for a finish, you'd probably have to come off the top of the building to get your opponent to stay down. And although many wrestlers before Hulk Hogan had used a variant of a sitting leg drop onto their opponents, there is no doubt that this was the moment that the move really came into the history books of pop culture. Hogan is said to have learnt his iconic finishing technique whilst he was a wrestler in Japan. He said, So when I brought it back to the States and I started dropping the leg and the referee started counting, it was like a cannon, one, two, three. So I knew I was onto something, but it was just my luck that I dropped the leg drop in Japan and I got the reaction that I did, so I just stuck with it. The finishing sequence would occasionally change depending on the storyline and opponent. For instance, with giant wrestlers, the sequence might involve a body slam. Listen up, Hulkamaniacs! 
I'm taking over Crazy Taxi. So what you gonna do when the power of Hulkamania runs wild on Crazy Taxi? Whilst working under Jeff Jarrett in the CWA, Hogan met a man who would go on to be his most significant opponent, Andre the Giant. One of the first televised meetings between the pair came in the most unusual of manners. Two hot prospect wrestlers, both with bright futures, finally coming face to face for an epic pro wrestling bout. But no, Andre the Giant and Terry the Hulk Boulder met in an arm wrestling match. Not something that was particularly popular at the time, nor did either character ever proclaim to be a better arm wrestler. It does show a particular type of strength I suppose, and the CWA did manage to make the event into somewhat of a spectacle for television. The two enormous men, both young and enthusiastic, showed excessive bravado and puffed their chest out before sitting down nice and calmly and aggressively holding hands for a short while. Certainly not the most exciting first face-off for the two great men. Nonetheless, it would set the tone for the next decade, and a rivalry which will go down in the ages as a must-see. Pelea was awarded with his first championship belt of his career on December 1st, 1979, after defeating the NWA Southeastern Heavyweight Champion in front of an excitable crowd in Knoxville, Tennessee. Belair's first championship run would come to an end in little over a month, when, in January of 1980, he lost the belt to Bob Armstrong before leaving the company. That same year, industry stalwart Terry Funk was the next man to see the huge potential of Belair's Hulk character. Funk brought Belair and Vincent J. McMahon together for the first time. The boss, McMahon, was supposedly delighted with Hulk's physique and attitude towards the industry in their initial meeting. McMahon suggested the name Hogan to give Hulk an Irish appeal and from there on out the name Hulk Hogan stuck and became known by young children and adults alike around the world. One initial idea of Vincent J. McMahon's, which didn't go over as well, was his insistence that the newly deemed Hulk Hogan would dye his hair bright orange in order to cement the racial stereotype that the boss was trying to achieve. Hogan, not certain of his place on the roster at this point, took another risk and stuck to his gut. Hulk Hogan was a fine name in his opinion and has a great and memorable ring to it. However, he was in no way going to dye his hair bright orange. By Belair's own admission, his hair was thinning, and the red-orange dye would have been a step too far. Belair argued, I'll be a blonde Irish person, to which McMahon conceded was acceptable, not wanting to pass on a chance to sign what could potentially be the next big thing in pro wrestling. After signing the necessary contracts, Hulk Hogan had his first match in then WWF, a victory over Harry Valdez, in a televised match on November the 17th, 1979. A win that would set the tone for the coming trajectory of Hulk Hogan in WWF and beyond. In pro wrestling, there are a small number of venues which are synonymous with the art form. Arenas of glitter-covered combat which have over the last century been host to some of the most iconic moments in the squared circle. The Tokyo Dome has given us hard-fought matches with the likes of Antonio Inoki, the Great Muta, Kazuchika Okada and Hiroshi Tanahashi, which will live long in pro wrestling fans' memories. In front of approximately 55,000 fans who are all there to witness New Japan's biggest event of the year, Wrestle Kingdom. Likewise, a number of athletes have become known for selling out what could be considered the mecca of pro wrestling in the West, Madison Square Garden in New York City. Originally built in 1959, the arena has a maximum capacity of around 20,000. However, with the ring, stage and ramp, wrestling shows are often forced to host many less fans than that at their events. MSG has hosted numerous important sporting events also, including the NBA Finals as well as a whole host of musical talents, the likes of Elton John, Grateful Dead and Bob Marley have all put on notable shows there. Perhaps with its smaller capacity, the venue doesn't have the overwhelming awe you must feel being privileged enough to obtain a seat at the Tokyo Dome. However, for what MSG gives up in size, it makes up for in its intimate appeal. 
a sense of real togetherness from the fans in attendance for some of pro wrestling's most historic nights. Bruno San Martino and Lou Thayer's are both names that immediately pop into mind when thinking of Madison Square Garden. The iconic building located in Midtown Manhattan, the other name which initially comes to mind when thinking of MSG, is Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan made his first appearance at the hallowed arena going up against Ted DiBiase, another match which saw Hogan, the victor after a ferocious bear hug, subdued the million dollar man. And as with his initial WWF debut, Hulk Hogan began a lineage of success at MSG, which those in the live audience certainly couldn't have predicted. A few fleeting moments which poof out of existence in a flash, but which now, in hindsight, seem so significant. Beyond the realm of pro wrestling, this image is still significant. A memorable moment which even if you can't name which event or match this photo was taken during, you'll recognise both competitors and at the very least have some fuzzy recollection for the images as a whole. The first time Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan came face to face in WWF was in 1980 and the moment, although now in the modern day is worth looking back on, as a moment of inception for a rivalry which would simmer to a boil for years to come, the initial match itself is overshadowed by the fact that the two men came to blows in no less than 16 matches together that year. The rivalry continued to build momentum as Andre, the fan favourite, drew heavy support over the less popular and less well-established Hogan. The pair's 16-match run saw Hogan on a losing streak for the first time in his wrestling career, culminating in a historic match in August of 1980. Hulk Hogan with classy Freddie Blassie at his side versus Andre the Giant at the Shea Stadium is the first major event which saw Hogan body slam Andre and although there is a more famous body slam to come, up to this point the body slam at the Shea Stadium was the standout wrestling moment of the time and gave Hulk Hogan a huge step up in terms of notoriety amongst fans and respect amongst his peers. Although during the match Hogan would eventually lose, it was clear that he had not only given a stellar display of pro wrestling acumen, but also that he indeed kicked out before the referee had counted to three. Meaning, of course, Hogan never technically lost the match at the Shea Stadium. This led to a confrontation where Hulk Hogan, flanked by his manager, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Andre and demanded a rematch, one which was granted and took place the next week on television. Hogan was at a disadvantage during the bout and resorted to underhanded tactics, attacking Andre with brass knuckles and causing a severe cut to his forehead before fleeing from the match. Over the following months, the two men would continue to be bitter rivals, facing off in a number of similar matches which saw Hogan cheating and dominating during most of the bout, only to lose by pinfall to Andre at the end. However, before any real conclusion could be drawn for the two men, who had now faced each other almost 20 times. The straight line towards the top for Hulk Hogan, for the first time in WWF, went off course. It was at this time that Hulk Hogan was deemed worthy of an elusive WWF heavyweight title opportunity, one which would see him face off against a man who could not be any further away from Hogan on the pro wrestling spectrum, Bob Backlund. The personification of old school grappling with his no nonsense attire, pasty white skin, and purebred baby face grin on his chubby little chops. No doubt this man was an absolute monster in the ring, but when standing next to the much taller, more colourful, and handsomely tanned Hogan, you could see why the McMahons wanted to move the belt to their newest star. However, at this time, Bob Backlund was a well established champion. He didn't want this new up-and-comer with what Backlund saw as a brash personality and over-the-top looks, taking away his precious belt. This led to the first major altercation for Hulk Hogan with his bosses in WWF. Vince McMahon Sr. and Hulk Hogan had already had an agreement in place for Hogan to win the belt. When Bob Backlund refused and Vince McMahon Sr. decided to hold off on giving Hogan the belt, he left. Ichiban! So what do you study today? Well, I tell you, today is the most exciting day of my wrestling career, simply because I'm the WWF champion five times. But the most important thing to me 
is to make sure that my career ends in Japan. I want to come back to New Japan Pro Wrestling and I'm back. The IWGP belt is the most important belt in the world today. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes again. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes again. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday comes again. By 1980. Hulk's popularity had reached new heights and he began to participate in an initiative which saw current WWF wrestlers travel to Asia to feature on the New Japan Pro Wrestling show. Being a relatively enormous man in comparison to the average man on the Japanese roster, with his bright clothing and gleaming streak of blonde hair, Hogan stood out immediately, earning the moniker Ichiban from the Japanese fans which translates to number one. Hogan's first appearance on New Japan television came on May the 13th, 1980, and over the next few years, he would spend time sporadically touring around Japan and training with a different crowd of wrestlers. At this time, Hulk Hogan did well to adapt to a more physically demanding style of wrestlers popular in Asia. Up until this point, Hogan had primarily relied on simple front slams, standing suplexes and leg drops in his matches. However, the Japanese audience demanded a more technically advanced moveset from their wrestlers. Hogan took his Japanese counterpart's advice on board and incorporated drop kicks into his matches and even changed his tried and tested finisher to an axe bomber lariat. His initial run with New Japan included feuds with fellow American Abdullah the Butcher and Japanese legend Tatsumi Fujinami. In 1981, Hulk Hogan was spotted by the casting director for the upcoming film Rocky III when he sought the good wishes of Vincent J. McMahon. They were not given. The father of the current owner of WWE thought that putting such a hot up-and-coming wrestling star in a fictional film could undermine the legitimacy of pro wrestling. After all, in 1980, kayfabe was still alive and well and most children and even some adults continued to believe in the real life actions of pro wrestlers in the ring. Vincent J McMahon was a traditionalist and held huge power in the pro wrestling world and at this moment as Belaya defied his boss's orders and went to the set to film his now iconic role in Rocky 3, Belaya's decision must have to him at least at the time like a huge gamble, one that ultimately paid off in the long run. In the film, Belair plays the role of the villain, thus when he returned to the ring and made his debut for the AWA in 1980, he was revealed as a vain heel and paired with luscious Johnny Valiant as his equally vain manager. However, after several segments where Belair aimed to get the fans to boo him, his natural charisma and looks had the opposite effect on the crowd. His appearance in a big Hollywood film gave him a sense of star power and his size helped him to stand out on the mat. Belaya soon became a fan favourite and had several memorable run-ins with the likes of Nick Bockwinkle and the Heenan family. By this point, Vince McMahon Jr., Vince J. McMahon's son, stepped up his role after years of learning the inner workings of the wrestling industry and after a few years as the head honcho, Vince McMahon Jr. had really hit his stride. Purchasing the Capital Wrestling Corporation and WWF from his father, with it assuming complete control of the brand and heading up its new board of decision makers. By the end of 1983, Vincent K. McMahon had picked Hulk Hogan as his main star. He offered Belaya a long-term contract fitting in value for that of WWF's new centerpiece. In St. Louis, Missouri in December of 1983, Hulk Hogan returned on screen for WWF in a match where he quickly defeated Bill Dixon and received the fan reaction which both Hogan and McMahon were hoping for. Five times World Wrestling Federation Champion. This belt is just a toy. It's like a trinket on a Christmas tree, like an ornament. The belt that I want is the one that the great Muta has, the IWGP belt. Because when Hulk Hogan wins the IWGP Championship, which he should have right now, it will prove that New Japan Pro Wrestling and Hulk Hogan is the greatest, the greatest partners in the world because I want all the great wrestlers to come to me and I want them to come to Japan where I can wrestle. 
In both 1982 and 83, the pair came together to overcome their differences and take home the titles in both years of the Madison Square Garden Tag League. But having a successful run as a tag team was not the only moment shared between arguably two of the biggest names in all of pro wrestling history. In 1983 on June 2nd, Hogan took part in the inaugural International Wrestling Grand Prix and won after defeating the historic Japanese icon Antonio Inoki in the final. Being named as the first ever winner of this tournament saw Hulk Hogan named as the IWGP's first champion and was placed in a position to hold the belt until challenged by next year's Grand Prix winner. Essentially a precursor for the IWGP heavyweight title which for many years was considered to be Japan's top belt. At this time, Hogan carried with him the WWF World Heavyweight Belt and even defended the championship in two occasions in Japan against Saiji Sakaguchi and Fujinami. The WWF title is just a stepping stone. I want the IWG belt in it. Ichiban! During this time, Hulk Hogan had become well known for his feud against Inoki in Japan. After their tag team success, the two men were firmly back to being enemies. Hogan had continued to return for spells in Japan whilst under contract with WWF in the US and had never officially defended his original IWGP title. Antonio Inoki the whole while had become a mainstay on the Japanese wrestling scene and his company was growing more successful by the day. When Hogan returned to Japan proclaiming his honour and willingness to defend his title, it was so perfectly poetic that Antonio Inoki had just won that year's IWGP and was the only rightful challenger for the American. Although the hype and anticipation was well built up, the final showdown between Hogan and Inoki was ruined by interference by Ricky Choshu, which saw Hulk lose via countout, which proved to be a deflating end to this chapter of the story to say the least. It was during this time that on December the 18th, 1983, Balea married Linda Claridge, their glamorous wedding taking place in Japan and was quite the media spectacle. Hogan had become somewhat of a celebrity in Asia and his wedding was even aired on Japanese television. Some of the biggest stars of the wrestling world were in attendance with the likes of Vincent K. McMahon, Andre the Giant and Antonio Inoki sharing in the festivities. Normally a performer's personal life is just that. I want to draw a line somewhere when I make these videos and attempt to respect the privacy of the wrestlers whose achievements I aim to document. However, in this case, Hulk Hogan has opened up his life to the world and reaped the rewards of his decision to lay bare his family's dirty secrets. I intend for this video to be as much about Terry Balea as it is about Hulk Hogan, but I think that the way in which he has chosen to force his way into the public eye and use his family as a means to stay relevant is incredibly telling when we look at why a person may act in such a manner. I think it's important to be able to really understand the mysteries and legends of Hulk Hogan. The wedding in Japan seemed full of joy, love and laughter. There seems to be a genuine sense of happiness for all involved, especially Linda and Terry. It's the start of a personal journey for Hogan and for his family which has had so many tumultuous highs and lows, it's impossible not to see their over the top star studded wedding in hindsight as an encapsulation of everything that went wrong with the man behind the character. For all my Hulkamaniacs that have stuck with me through the thick and thin, train, said their prayers and eat their vitamins, be a survivor man, don't smoke it's a joke. By January of 1984, Hogan had officially made the confirmed change from bad guy to good when he fought off the Wild Samoans and saved his then rival Bob Backlund. After surviving the onslaught, Backlund declared about Hogan, he's changed his ways, he's a great man, he's told me he's not going to have Blassie around. Which was also confirmation that Hogan would finally split from his heel manager in classy Freddie Blassie, another clear indication of Hogan's new noble intentions. Backland indeed had survived the attack by the Wild Samoans, however he would not be fit to compete in his upcoming match, a title match which the fans had been looking forward to. Hogan, now friends with Backland and with the full support of the fans, was brought in as a replacement. A shot for the WWF heavyweight title against legendary in-ring villain, the Iron Sheik. 
the two men would face off at Madison Square Garden on an evening when the arena was filled with anticipation. The crowd booed as before the match, Iron Sheik revealed his new manager to be none other than Freddie Blassie, which really added a level of hatred to the feud. During the match, Hogan's task was clear. He must evade the Sheik's deadly camel clutch. After all, the Iron Sheik had won the majority of his recent matches with his version of the vicious submission. More importantly, up until this point, nobody had survived being caught in the camel clutch. Hogan began in the match to ascend. He began on a path which would see him becoming almost immortal within the confines of the ring ropes. After a leg drop on the 1-2-3, commentator Gorilla Monsoon proclaimed, Hulkamania is here. Hulk Hogan was confirmed as the new king of WWF, and as the fans in attendance exploded with delight, another historic early moment of WWE's wrestling history ends with Hogan shimmering in gold, his arms raised as the deserved victor. So, with his first WWF championship around his waist, in the United States, Hulk Hogan was now strapped to the proverbial rocket and destined for the moon. Back in America, and Hogan was causing friction once again. Okay, maniacs, here we go. However, this time it was with a giant, angry superhero. As Hulk Hogan's notoriety grew, so did his ability to sell merchandise and earn money from his name. This is where Marvel comes in. They were frustrated by Hulk Hogan's apparent infringement of their incredible Hulk character and sought compensation. Before the issue could go to court, Marvel Comics, Hulk Hogan and the WWF came to a financial agreement which saw Marvel receive 0.9% of reportable gross merchandise revenue associated with Hogan, $100 for each of his matches and 10% of WWF's portion of his other earnings under this name. Marvel also obtained the commercial rights to the names Hulk Hogan, Hulkster and Hulkamania for two decades. Hogan was no longer permitted to be called incredible or Hulk. He was also banned from wearing the colours purple and green. There is even a comic from 1988, Marvel Comics Presents number 45, where the Incredible Hulk becomes enraged and picks up a wrestler in one scene, only to sling them brutally from a high up platform. The reason given on the other page is that he picked the wrong name. Soon after, in 1983, at the annual meeting of the National Wrestling Alliance, Vince McMahon Jr. or Vince K. McMahon backed out of his commitments and cut ties with the NWA, which understandably angered the other promoters and started huge rivalries between the WWF and the NWA territories, and as the WWF sought to run shows across the whole country, this became a major issue. WWF and Vince K. McMahon used this new wider coverage to leverage deals with advertisers and larger television companies. This afforded the WWF a bankroll, which would allow them to continue their acquisition of new talent and go on to headhunt the best performers in the business. A true golden age of pro wrestling, the world was changed forever as soon as the ink had dried on McMahon's ownership contract taking the WWF as a regional promotion and using the existing platform to create industry icons and pop culture figures such as Rowdy Roddy Piper, Andre the Giant and Mr. Perfect, all of whom had previous relationships with the AWA and NWA. In 1984, Vince McMahon believed that WWF were ready to take their next step on their journey of conquest of the United States wrestling scene. Vince and his wife Linda put their savings and everything they had into promoting WWF and pro wrestling's biggest show in decades, setting WWF apart from the NWA at the time, who themselves had been promoting NWA Starcade in years previous as their main show of the year. On March 31st of 1985, WWF's WrestleMania aired from Madison Square Garden in New York, the spiritual home of the WWF and premiered live on MTV. A partnership known as the Rock and Wrestling Connection proved extremely fruitful for all involved, with WWF promoting the event as a supercard, inviting the likes of Muhammad Ali, Mr. T, Cindy Lauper and Liberace to participate in the groundbreaking event. WrestleMania was the first ever pro wrestling pay-per-view and saw the inception of a business model for WWF that would evolve and adapt all the way until the modern day. 
Hogan's inclusion in the main event was a given. The show was designed in part to be built around Hulkamania. Vince McMahon saw a perfect chance to bring more eyes to their inaugural show with the inclusion of the aforementioned celebrities. Hogan would appear in a tag match paired with actor Mr. T in a match which included Liberace and Muhammad Ali as the ringside officials. Hogan and Mr. T defeated the heel team of Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff. A tag match which, although not the best produced or fondly remembered match, is still incredibly important in the overall timeline of wrestling, marking a turning point in the industry towards the rock and wrestling era. WWE's first foray into the world of animation came back in 1985 during the period of interconnection between the wrestling business and the world of celebrity. Designed, animated and produced by the creative team over at DIC Animation City, originally a French company who had recently moved their operations to Burbank, California. DIC Animation had proved themselves with the creation of other animated series, Inspector Gadget and The Real Ghostbusters, both of which showed themselves to be popular. As DIC and the WWF at the time came together to generate potential ideas for their new cartoon, it was clear that the over-the-top and wildly adventurous type of cartoon that was popular in the mid-1980s would naturally be a great fit. Taking the core ideas of good versus evil, the cartoon would feature the current wrestling roster and their likenesses paired into either the heel or face camp for the purposes of making each character more easily recognisable to a younger audience. The titular Hulk Hogan led the heroes, which featured icons of the time such as Junkyard Dog, Captain Lou Albano, Andre the Giant, Wendy Richter, Jimmy Superfly Snooker, Hillbilly Jim and Tito Santana. Roddy Piper was the leader of the opposition, with his ragtag group of heels, which included the Iron Sheik, Nikolai Volkov, the Fabulous Moolah, Big John Studd and Mr. Fuji. Before watching the show, I was excited to see how these iconic characters would translate to the 2D. The list of names mentioned previously reads like a who's who of 1980s pro wrestling, with a host of the biggest names attached. As someone who was born in 1991, I never lived through this time period, so looking back there was always a mysterious fog which accompanied any memory of 80s wrestling. However, as soon as I watched episode 1, I knew I wouldn't be hearing much about the real life characters through their cartoon counterparts. It was clear that the voices which are so recognisable to so many were not the same in rock and wrestling. I looked it up and indeed, these characters were voiced by a talented selection of voice actors replicating the pro wrestlers famous phrases with varying degrees of success. Several of the real wrestlers did appear during the several live segments featured throughout the show, but it would have been a logistical nightmare to attempt to design, write, animate and produce rock and wrestling while simultaneously attempting to get 10 or so of the wrestlers into the recording booth to record the lines, which were intentionally meant to air alongside the stories from within the ring in WWF at the time. When the idea for rock and wrestling was originally pitched, it featured a principle which in concept sounds brilliant. The showrunners for the cartoon would be given small amounts of information from WWE, things about storylines beforehand, enabling them to go through the creation process and have the actions performed by the characters in their animation reflect those of their real life counterparts on the live action WWE shows. A way to build more audience connection to the characters on the screen, whilst also bringing in a new set of fans who watch the cartoons and gain an interest in watching more WWF products. However, in reality, the production times for the cartoon ended up overrunning what was initially expected during the planning phase, added to the unpredictable nature of real life, meant that several key figures that were featured prominently in the animation, such as Jimmy Superfly Snooker and Wendy Richter, had in fact left the WWF in early 1985, just in time for DIC animations to write them into the show, design and animate their characters, and have a pair of voice actors record all of their lines, 
it wasn't within the budget to remake these sections with other wrestlers and thus they remained in rock and wrestling long after their departures. Roddy Piper, the leader of the bad guys in the cartoon, was an evil villain on WWF television when the animation first aired. However, he changed his ways in WWF and was firmly a good guy by the time Rock and Wrestling was only halfway through finishing all of their aired episodes, including the entirety of season 2. The exact opposite happened with Andre the Giant, and thus you can see that the effort of creating cohesive stories that intertwined between the cartoon and real life were seemingly fruitless. So, the idea was quickly dropped as the rest of the episodes were created. Most of Rock and Wrestling's stories as you watch through them, surprisingly, have very little to do with wrestling. The show becomes more of a fun telling of some silly stories which just happen to involve heroes who are pro wrestlers and the villains the same. Almost none of the entire two series run takes place in a wrestling ring and there aren't very many wrestling moves shown in a traditional sense. This is something that was entirely unexpected as I sat down to watch the series for the first time. But as I made my way through all of the episodes, it wasn't something which I felt ruined the program in any way. The structure of each episode is incredibly easy to digest. Some of them have stories which take place over the full 25-ish minutes runtime, and some episodes are split into two parts to tell two 12-minute long stories. Both formats work to make the entire 26-episode run fly by. We can't have a program called Rock and Wrestling, which features wrestling, but no rock. The cartoon regularly featured a recurring segment which showed the music video for the song Land of a Thousand Dances, which was a track from the album creatively titled The Wrestling Album. Notable for its inclusion of several famous wrestling faces singing and dancing including Lou Albano, King Kong Bundy, Bret Hart and the Fabulous Moolah. The introduction theme for Rock and Wrestling was created by Jim Steinman and was liked so much by the production staff and wrestlers alike it went on to be used as real life Hulk Hogan's entrance theme for a while in WWF before he transitioned to his much more famous Real American theme. Jim Steinman's work on the track would not be lost to time however as later he would rework the Rock and Wrestling music then known as Hulk Hogan's theme and turn it into a track called Ravishing which featured on Bonnie Tyler's 1986 album Secret Dreams and Forbidden Fire. In the modern day, WWE owns the rights to rock and wrestling and have featured the full two series run since 2015 on the WWE Network, if you indeed wanted to check it out for yourself. I wouldn't by any stretch say that this cartoon, which originally was created for children, is a must watch. It simply isn't. The jokes can fall pretty flat, some of the writing is cringe inducingly out of date, and the characters are mostly one dimensional versions of already inflated egos from pro wrestling. If you like great cartoons and anime, there are plenty of other places to go to get your fix of exciting and entertaining 2D. If you like pro wrestling then, unfortunately, past the fact that the cast is made up of facsimiles of real life pro wrestlers you won't be getting much in-ring action from rock and wrestling. But if you're like me, you're a fan of both animation, silly humour and pro wrestling of the past, then this little 1980s time capsule is full of moments which allow you to sit back and enjoy the warm nostalgic fuzz of a bygone era and a simpler time in the world of children's entertainment. Hogan continued on with his run of high profile victories within WWF, the next year at the sequel to WrestleMania. Vince McMahon wanted to go even bigger than the previous year, so for WrestleMania 2 the event was split across three venues. The Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum in New York, the Rosemont Horizon in Illinois and the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena in LA. Each separate event was put on simultaneously with the roster being divided into three individual cards. The televised event would flip between the three, with each venue hosting its own co-main event. Mr. T fought in a boxing match against Roddy Piper, a tag title match and the real main event of the evening, Hulk Hogan defeating King Kong Bundy inside of a steel cage to retain his World Heavyweight Championship. Arguably, None have made more of an impact on popular culture around the world of pro wrestling 
for better and for worse than Hulk Hogan. By this point in his career, Hulk Hogan had become a household name across the US and was well known in Japan and Europe too. A man who managed to monetize almost all aspects of his life, from his family's very own reality show, to lending his likeness and name to a whole host of terrible and poorly thought out products and services. Do you wanna be in my game, my game, my game, wanna be in my game? Aside from pro wrestling and drama, one other constant through Belaya's life has been his love for music. His time spent practicing and touring the local area in his teens had left him with a desire to pursue his musical dreams, long after he hung up his guitar and traded it in for some wrestling boots. Talking of boots, in 1985 Hogan formed another band, this time named Hulk Hogan and the Wrestling Boot Band which featured longtime friend Mouth of the South Jimmy Hart, his then wife Linda and collaborator JJ McGuire. The quartet, fronted by Hogan, released a CD titled Hulk Rules. The 10 track album, which mixes in terrible renditions of pop, rock and even some rap, featured such classic and memorable hits as Hulksters in the House, Hulksters Back, Hulks the One, Hulkster in Heaven and Hulk Rules. I think it's fairly obvious what the focus of the band was, simply to fulfil the musical dreams of said Hulkster and provide a platform to further grow his fame outside of pro wrestling. Now this one's pretty sad. In the only song in which Hogan sings on the album called Hulkster in Heaven, the themes revolve around a young Hulk Hogan fan who died. The lyrics according to Hogan's autobiography were written to honour a boy who had attended a WWF show at Wembley in 1992. To see his favourite wrestler Hogan, but sadly, he passed away before the end of the event. In his autobiography, Hogan writes, He was supposed to be sitting ringside, but I went out to wrestle and I didn't see him there. After the match, I came back and said, Where's the kid? They told me, Oh, he died before the match got underway. Hogan goes on to say that immediately following the terrible news, he and Jimmy Hart went backstage and began to write the lyrics to Hulkster in Heaven as a way of dealing with the trauma and had the idea to give the proceeds from the song to the family of the deceased boy who Hogan explained were dealing with medical costs, something which may have led to his untimely death. The lyrics of the song show Hogan's pain when he sings, I wish Hulk's love could bring you back. When the Hulkster comes to heaven, we'll tag up again. And the emotional lines, I used to tear my shirt, but now you tore my heart. I knew you were a Hulkamaniac right from the start. The death of a child can affect families and friends who may never overcome the sadness of their loss. A truly dark and emotional tale, I'm sure you agree. The fact that Hogan went above and beyond to help out financially is, in my opinion, is a real act of honour in my books. Or it would be, if any of what I just told you was true. In 1992, WWF put on several shows at Wembley in London, none of which featured Hulk Hogan in any capacity at all. Furthermore, JJ Maguire has dispelled these lies, explaining how he wrote the song with Hogan in 1994, two years after this story is supposed to have taken place. We don't even pay for our medical expenses in the UK, so what was all the medical bills that he was giving the money to the kid to pay for? Hulk didn't wrestle at Wembley in 1992, he didn't meet a sickly fan before the match, who later sadly died, and he didn't give any of the proceeds from the album to anyone except those in the band, and of course himself. He lied to make himself look better and to make more money, and he did it at the expense of the feelings of families who have lost a loved one. It's that simple. The Hulk Rules album was a critical flop upon its release, but it has since gone on to become something of a collector's item and cult classic amongst wrestling fans. The track American Made would go on to become Hulk Hogan's entrance theme during his time in WCW and is probably the most fondly remembered tune from the album. The pro wrestling website WrestleCrap criticises the album saying, The Hulkster's in the house and invading your eardrums with the force of a Class A killstorm. Highlights include every song mentioning Hogan by name, no egotism here, and Jimmy Hart singing with a clothespin on his nose. Hogan, however, did not allow this lukewarm response to his music to slow him down. 
he performed a duet with Green Jelly, a cover of the ill-fated I'm the Leader of the Gang Gary Glitter track, a song which, due to the nature of the events surrounding its original creator, would much rather be lost to the annals of time by all involved in this cover version. Hulk Hogan has also appeared throughout the years in several music videos where he has not lent his musical talents but rather his celebrity personality. He portrayed Starlight Starbright in a wrestling themed love ballad by Dolly Parton named Headlock on My Heart which is a personal favourite of mine. A brief story which featured the love of a fictional wrestler and a fan who buys a ticket to his wrestling matches to sit in the front row. Before the pair fall in love and we're treated to the most 1980s pro wrestling moment of all time when Dolly Parton and Hulk Hogan are married inside of a WWF wrestling ring. All the time Hulk Hogan is wearing the most glorious sleeveless tuxedo and giving us at home the wink of a lifetime. This song was featured on Dolly Parton's TV show and seems like everyone involved had a lot of fun making it. I'm a secret Dolly Parton mark and seeing two worlds collide like this brought a wide smile to my face. Hogan has also appeared in a multitude of other music videos. His connection with MTV during the rock and wrestling era meant that he had connections with those who were making the videos at the time. The musical bug may run in the family for Hogan. His daughter Brooke has released three poorly received pop albums with their very own music videos. To be honest, it always felt to me like Brooke Hogan was simply living off the success of her family name, able to attempt to create marketable music with little to no skill, purely by her father's money and influence. I'm sorry if you like this kind of music. Who am I to tell you what to like? I'm a pro wrestling fan after all, I clearly have no taste. But going back, Brooke's musical career, which seemed to have ended in 2017, when she released her last single, toes the line somewhere between high school musical pep rally fodder and pussycat dolls heavy breathing and reliance on catchiness to sell an album. Truly horrid stuff. Hogan even got called out during a diss track by former friend and wrestling ally macho man Randy Savage, who rapped the lyrics to the song Be A Man, which include Be a man Hulk, come on, don't be scared, you're running from macho man, that's what I heard. Doesn't really rhyme, does it? I don't know why two balding men in their 40s are arguing via the medium of rap, but I would have loved to have seen a freestyle battle between the two back in 2003. Hulk Hogan has made millions of dollars through selling his likeness in order for companies, big and small, to sell a product. Putting a muscle-clad fitness icon on your advertisements for vitamins and supplements seems like a perfect fit, and something which I never have an issue with. A recommendation on health foods from a man who has spent most of his life training and staying in shape seems pretty sensible, right? I can even see the connection between beauty and hygiene products. Say what you will about Hulk Hogan, but that man stays fresh, no doubt in my mind. But would you seriously consider taking advice about your credit score from this? Don't let bills blur your vision, brother. Do you want to consolidate all of your monthly loan repayments into one simple, affordable monthly payment? I have a solution. 1-800-LOAN-MART, brother. Do you want a TV? I try, dude. What do we talk about? Perhaps I could interest you in some other kinds of electronics. Maybe a paper towel. The professional wrestler Hulk Hogan. Or a fucking chicken cordon bleu. Sorry, cordon bleu. Brother, I was at Arby scarfing down a chicken cordon bleu. And that brings us to the wonderful and wacky combination of one of the 1980s and 90s most over the top and beloved superstars and food. To get this big, you need to eat big, so I'm sure Hulk Hogan knows a thing or two about eating food. Aside from music and wrestling, Terry Belair always expressed an interest in running a small beachside cafe someday, something which he would later go on to achieve. However, the beginning of this culinary journey goes way back to the Mall of America in Bloomington, Minnesota. In 1985, pasta mania was running wild as Hulk brought in a team to create pasta-based dishes and sell the dishes such as Hulkaroos and Hulk U's, both of which I've got absolutely no idea what they refer to. The only hulk -a ruse here is the ruse that this restaurant was anything other than incredibly low quality food sold at a hugely marked up price because 
While you and your stupid kid were eating your Hulk-flavoured pasta sauce, you could look up and see an enormous picture of Hulk Hogan with a yellow and red chef's outfit. Notice you never actually see Hogan eating the pasta? I wonder why. Although Pastamania was widely publicised with the help of WCW at the time, the restaurant was inevitably a complete failure and closed within a year of opening. Later, while talking to Conan O'Brien on The Tonight Show, Hogan spoke of how he was invited to be the face of a new grilling product, but had taken too much time to respond to the offer and wasn't interested. That grill later went on to be represented by famous ex-boxer George Foreman and became somewhat of a household must-have for a while making Foreman huge amounts of money, all of which Hogan admits could have been his. But no fret, Hogan wasn't disappointed, he signed a deal that would go on to be even bigger than that of the George Foreman grill, something which would make even more money and be an even bigger success. No, I'm just kidding. Hulk Hogan became the face of the Hulk Hogan Thunder Mixer, a food processor which nobody bought and and nobody outside of wrestling fans would probably even remember. Hi guys, welcome back. Bob and I just showed you how my ultimate grill replaced over $1,200 worth of professional kitchen appliances. Hogan did go on to eventually get his name slapped on the box for a grill, confidently named the Hulk Hogan Ultimate Grill. It turned out to nobody's surprise, in fact not to be the Ultimate Grill and stopped production soon after its launch. Don't forget about Hogan Energy from 2006, a delicious energy drink which was distributed by Soco Energy in the US but never proved popular enough to continue production. Head to Walmart for all your delicious processed pre-packaged microwavable Hulkster burgers. You even have a choice of antibiotic chicken flavour, hamburgers which are neither ham nor burger, or a cheeseburger the composition of which is yet to be identified by the science community. Yum. One thing that is great is when somebody achieves their lifetime goal. It's cool that Hogan wanted to be by the beach, relaxing and being around food and people. In 2012 on New Year's Eve, Hogan's Beach Restaurant was opened in Tampa, Florida, and seemingly Hogan enjoyed his time there, so good for him. During controversies with Hogan's private life being made public, his name and association with Hogan's Beach Restaurant was removed in 2015. This led to the opening of another restaurant in an area near Clearwater Beach called Hogan's Hangout, which seems to be where Hogan spent most of his time up until this day. A place to sell his food as well as a host of memorabilia and merchandise from the Hulkster. Which takes me to my next topic. You all know how important merchandise sales are to pro wrestlers who can supplement their income via the direct support of their fans. Merchandise sales are something I can really get behind as a way of supporting your favourite in-ring performer. But like so many other aspects of Hulk Hogan's life, this man took it to the next fucking level. From his peak in the 1980s until the modern day, there is barely an object which has yet to be branded in red and yellow or slapped with a big Hulkamania sticker. You think I'm joking? Well, how about this plushy Hogan head bopper toy for children to punch? Or this sweater with this design? How about a set of fruit juice drinks or perhaps this handy Hulk Hogan lunchbox? What about this Hulk Hogan decorative light switch or this weirdly creepy chair? Want to sit on Hulk Hogan's lap? Well, now you can. Take some selfies in this hilarious Hulk Hogan mask. You can see how out of control it's gotten. Every last one of these products is cheap tat mostly made of harmful plastic which were pumped out in their hordes and shipped out to unsuspecting idiots like me who gobbled it all up as a kid and are left with part of their house full of pro wrestling faces just staring back at you. Wow, sorry, that really got away from me. Hulk Hogan was so famous at a point that anything with his likeness or name would sell better than without the celebrity endorsement. He made so much money through his own ventures outside of pro wrestling that it gave him the power and confidence to take control of his own destiny within the grappling business. Because, unlike so many we see perform within the squared circle who don't have any other option than pro wrestling to make money, Hulk Hogan was fortunate enough to take the platform he was given by WWF and turn himself into a multi-millionaire. And although we may judge these decisions, 
Can you say that you wouldn't have done the same given the chance to make so much money for such relatively easy work? I don't know if I could. But now back to the timeline. Through all the distractions of record label contracts and merchandise deals, Hulk Hogan still managed to rise to the occasion and brought forward some of the most entertaining and emotive promos of his career in 1987. In the build-up to what would be WWF's third WrestleMania show, Hulk Hogan had been the WWF champion for three years. Fans began to wonder if the Giant was having ideas about taking the belt from his friend. The next week, as Roddy Piper this time welcomed Andre onto his segment to present him with a trophy for being undefeated in WWF for 15 years, a totally made-up achievement, it became clear that Andre's trophy was a lot smaller in stature than the one that Hulk Hogan had recently been presented with and put the spotlight on himself. Something which, in the storyline, isn't a particularly nice thing for a heroic character to do. But as we see later on in Hogan's career, he's an expert at keeping himself in the limelight at the expense of others. After a few more weeks of back and forth where fans were left confused as to both men's intentions, Andre arrived on the set for another episode of Piper's Pit, but this time with Bobby Heenan as his manager, long time Nemogan ripping off his shirt and breaking his necklace. After more meetings and promos between Heenan, Hogan and Andre, the three men did an excellent job of building up the story of betrayal from Andre and creating a man who was once a beloved babyface and turning him into an evil heel for Hogan to clash with. On March 29th at the Pontiac Silverdome in front of a disputed 93,000 fans, one of the most significant moments in the whole of pro wrestling occurred. At WrestleMania 3, in one of the most iconic moments of Hogan's career, Hulk Hogan swept Andre the Giant off of his feet and slammed the behemoth right into the annals of sports entertainment legend. And although the moment is seared into most grappling fans' memories, the historic match was actually one when Hogan came crashing down onto Andre the Giant with his finisher, the leg drop. Regardless of the exact details of how the match was finished or how it was remembered, one thing is for certain that at WrestleMania 3, Hulk Hogan went from being a star to becoming a superstar. The true highest form of Hulkamania was achieved and fans around the world who weren't already believers in the free demandments were converted in their droves. The moment of the slam was shown on news television and garnered attention and parody from filmmakers and pro wrestlers alike for decades to come. A moment of pure excitement and jubilation, the likes of which pro wrestling can be so good at delivering. Everything just landed right, and the combination of elements that went into making this match, and indeed Hulkamania in general, are so rare that this type of mass appeal has only ever been reached by a number of athletes in the entire history of the squared circle. We're seeing what this guy is really made of, what he is, the greatest professional athlete in the world today. Look at this! He's Say your prayers, eat your vitamins, be true to yourself, true to your country, be a real American. <laughs> Say my prayers, eat my vitamins. Our brother, who is whole Hogan, hallowed be thy name. Thy ring doth come, thy will be done, as you slammed Andre at WrestleMania 3. Give us this day our daily leg drop, and forgive us jabronis, as we forgive those who are jabronis against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Papa Shango and the million dollar man Ted DiBiase. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, which is Hulkamania. 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 Hulkamania! Hulkamania! 
You shouldn't have come here, brother. You don't know what Hulkamania is really about. What you gonna do? Brother, brother, brother. Hulkamania's running wild. 24-inch by Jack, if you want the truth, then you don't have to look any further than these two 24-inch pythons and this baseball mitt fist. But you know what they say about the truth. The truth hurts, and it'll hurt even more when I have the power of my hundred billion Hulkamaniacs and also the power of my, uh, my... My vitamins! So what you gonna do, brother, when Hulkamania runs wild on you? Wrestling is weird. guy a racist like said the n-word during a sex tape that he made with his best friend's wife right am i right I am a real American. at this point hulk hogan was a financial success he was incredibly famous and well liked and he had maintained his position atop the mountain of wwf for years but, as we'll soon find out, good times don't always last, and the glory years of this once magnificent warrior of triumph and honour will come crashing to his knees. The international superstar born Terry Bollea was recently seen by millions in a different light. Okay, maniacs, here we go. We were not the most liked guys in the dressing room. We had a, a ton of heat with everybody. In a very short amount of time and financially, I was devastated. I've had a rough couple of years. I've had two really crazy years. The WWE broke ties with you. Did yes. you expect that was going to happen? No, I didn't. 